A very special program today. You are going to love this. I have with me one of God's mighty generals, Dr. Morris Sorello, and the people said, Amen. Amen. You know, this is going to be a precious time with you and I. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do. Well, Doc, you know, we've talked about this, and here we are today on Love World, and millions will be watching this. And what we would like to do today is I want to talk about Dr. Sorello's life. You know, I, I, I've not done that with many people. I did it with Oral, Rex Humbard, and Dr. Semerol. Mm. But the one with Dr. Semerol, we just sent the cameras. So in just a little bit, we're going to start talking about your life. Now, but first of all, you're 87 years old. Correct. I want to know, how is it possible that you can still travel and do more than you've done? Goodness, I mean, it's amazing every, what you're still every doing. Every year is more than the past year. And that's the way our life is supposed to be. Spiritually, it's supposed to be more this year than last year. And our outreach is supposed to be more this year than last year because the Spirit of God is a spirit that manifests itself through growth. That's how God gets glory. Mm. Now, I want to say thank you to Pastor Chris for allowing us to be together today. Yes. And uh, you met Pastor Chris just I recently. Sure did. I just ministered for him for two days uh, in a special conference, our own conference, about 25,000 ministers. You were in Nigeria. You also were in other parts of Africa. Yes. Just recent. Right. You went to Cairo, Egypt. Right. You were in Israel. Right. Anywhere else? In the last few days, I mean. We're talking... Well, in the last few weeks. Yeah, weeks is what I mean. Last but... few weeks. Uh, Many different places, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, as you know, Indonesia is the largest Muslim nation in the world. And uh, we had meetings all over Indonesia. I got a great story to tell you about uh, Indonesia whenever you have well, five, I wanna hear it. five minutes or so. But, but I want to just say something to all of you. Um, Dr. Sorello has touched more pastors probably than anyone else on the globe. And I'm talking about pastors, okay? Because everyone, you know, I'm 66, so I'm a little bit younger than you. <laughs> and, I, and we've known each other since 72. We're going yeah. early 70s anyways. When I met Dr. Sorello, I think through uh, Dr. Alex Ness, we're talking years and years ago in Canada. But, you know, everywhere I've traveled for years, I've met people who had been deeply influenced by your life, mm. including my life. And I want to tell the story first of what happened with me. Mm. And then we're going to start talking about your life. So I'm going to begin with this. Um, it was 1972. I used to attend a church in Toronto, Canada with a pastor, a dear pastor named Maxwell White. <laughs> you remember Maxwell White. He was probably one of the most dynamic uh, Bible teachers of his day and uh, very powerful on the subject, on the blood of Jesus. And uh, every Sunday night he would have deliverance meetings in his church. So anyways, one of the young people named Melon Stroud I still remember her name. She, t she said, would you like to go with me and some other young people from the church to hear Morris Sorello? I said, yeah, let's go. So we drove all of us, 10, 20 of us, I can't think now, to listen to you. And we we're in the, way in the back uh -huh. in this big, big ballroom in some hotel by the airport. And you came on and you sang How Great Thou Art and began to minister. And as we are worshiping, this is like in the first few minutes of the service, 
as you began to lead, and I remember uh, Mrs. Ness playing the organ for you. <laughs> and um, I felt a hand touch me here. Now, this lady, Marilyn Stroud, was right here, and I felt the hand, and so I opened my eyes. I said, can I help you? I thought she had touched my arm. And she looked at me. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, what did you want? And she didn't respond too well. She thought something was not right with me. And then we all went back to worship, and here again, the arm came back on my, uh, the hand came back on my arm. And I said, what do you want? And she looked at me, she said, what do you mean? I said, well, you touched me. I didn't touch you. I said, well, stop playing games. What are you doing? Went back to worship. Third time, there the arm again. I opened my eyes, and this time she had her hands up. Mm. And then I knew it was not Malin Stroud touching me. And I heard the Lord's voice very, very clearly. Mm. And I will never forget, he grabbed me like real tight over here. And his words were, I need you. <laughs> that happened in his meeting. This was way before Catherine. Catherine came in yeah. end of 73. This was probably mid-72. So I'm one of those, uh, those people that have been touched. And you and I have been friends for a long time. And we've, I've been to his home. Many of these preachers probably had, had not been to your home, but I have. And we've talked about all kinds of things. So we've talked about uh, a time when we would sit and just talk about Dr. Sorello's life. So, and I know you wrote a book, which we'll talk about later. Yeah. But you know, I want to say just one thing, a little caveat before you go on, and that is it's so important to know that the call of God is a sacred thing. Yeah. That angel touching Benny's arm was a sign of the will of God for this man's life. Amen. And from that moment on, God has used you, Benny, to touch this entire world. I'm so proud to know you. Well, I'm proud to know you, and I'm grateful to the Lord for what he has done in our life. You know, you're very committed to the Lord, and so am I. You know, the, the, the reason God used Catherine Kuhlman, Ralph Wilkerson, you know Ralph. Of course. He's, he's with the Lord now. And uh, he gave me a book that he had been given, Miss Kuhlman gave him, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs oh, my. years ago. And he said, would you like Very it? I said, yes, I would. And it was all a broken down book, an old book. You can still, of course, get it, you know, from wherever, Amazon or stores. But her book was an old copy. And I opened it in his home. And there in her own handwriting, grant me the privilege to be one of them. And I began to weep. I said, that's why God used her. And so, you know, whether that happens to us or not, it's the willingness because we love him so much. And you have proven your love for the Lord over and over and over again. So... Can Let's, I tell you another little story? Please, please. I was in Haiti, 1962, Haiti. Mm. And we were having, shaking the entire island. A group of pastors got together and spoke to a businessman, C.C. C. Ford, who came down with Demas Shikarian. Sure. Demas Shikarian was in that meeting. Mm. And um, they said, please tell Brother Cyril, don't have the meeting Sunday night. Cancel it, because we've heard that the voodoo doctors are planning to come in and create havoc in the meeting. And they said they're going to storm the platform and they're going to kill him. And this businessman, precious brother, C.C. Ford, mm -hmm. he stands up and he says, you're wasting your time. He said, Morris is not consecrated unto life, but he is consecrated 
unto death. We had the meeting Sunday night. Doc, can we go back and talk about your 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 beginning? Mm-hmm. So let's go back to your early days. Bring us there. Take us there. Uh, when were you saved? What year? Gosh, uh, this is my 73rd anniversary of ministry. Now you could have clapped there, and I would let you... Go ahead. (laughs) So, 73 73 years in ministry, but... But But that's when I got saved about a year before that. I got saved when I was 14. 14. Can I ask you, before you go on, did your mom, prior to your birth dedicate you to the Lord? No. My mama died when I was two years old. My mother was a Orthodox Jew. My father was a drunkard. He left the family. There were five of us when mom died. What nationality was your daddy? Italian. Cherulo, where are you going to get that name from? <laughs> I knew that part. I just wanted to ask you for the people's sake. So your daddy, Italian, your mom, and Jewish. Orthodox Jew. And the state, naturally, when you have five children and no mother and father, mm. the state takes over your life. So they took over my life. But because my mom was an Orthodox Jew, mm. If your mother's a Jew, you're a Jew. So I was raised Jewish. And I went from one foster home to another and finally ended up in a place in Clifton, New Jersey called the Daughters of Miriam. And that was an Orthodox Jewish orphanage. It was in that orphanage that I found Christ. What city were you born in? Passaic, New Jersey. In New Jersey. Mm. And you found the Lord? In in Clifton, New Jersey, which is a township right next to Passaic and Patterson. How did it happen? Oh, my. Please tell me. You don't have enough time. But I'd like to know at least the headlines. (laughs) If I can give you headlines, oh, Lord. God sent a Baptist nurse into the orphanage Mm. to have employment, which was a miracle because they didn't hire Gentiles. But she got a job there. Now, to give you the headline just quickly, she... Uh, had problems uh, in her own family and uh, as a result of that got the call of God on her life Mm. but unusually to the Jew and so this Gentile nurse gets a position in this Orthodox orphanage and she knows that God has sent her there. She's there one year. She's there two years. And one day, she's making the bed of some of the elderly people because it was not only a home for orphans, it was also an old age home for Jewish uh, people. Hmm that had passed, you know, certain age and uh, didn't have families and, and so forth to take care of them. So it, it was a mixture in the orphanage. She'd been there all this time. She dropped to her knees and she cried. She said, Lord, 
I know you led me here. She said, but I've been here for two years. I haven't had one chance to witness or testify for you. Now, she's Baptist. She doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She doesn't know anything much about only salvation and evangelism. That's it. And the Spirit of God speaks to this precious woman. Her name was Mrs. Kerr and says, get up and go to the window. So she gets up off her knees, it goes to the window, and the Holy Spirit speaks, what do you see? And she said, my Lord, I don't see anything. This big wooded area along the side of the orphanage. The Holy Spirit says, look again. And she says, all I see is a little boy. He's walking up the side of the uh, macadam driveway. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit, speaks to Mrs. Kerr and says, don't you ever say just a little boy because I have sent you here to bring him salvation. The, she said, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, I see something in that boy that I will use for my glory. That's how it started. And she, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, I'm going to give you mine. Some Kleenex. Here, here, wait, wait. Sorry. <laughs> okay, Ken, why don't you bring me some Kleenex? Ken works with Dr. Sorello. This is Thanks. live. It's okay. Thanks. Doc. <clears throat> That's how it started. And she came and witnessed to you? She did. She began to, you know how she began to witness to me? I mean, this is a 20th century miracle story. It's another chapter in the book of Acts. And you accepted the Lord when you were? When I was 14. 14 years old. 13, I was bar mitzvah. I carried the Torah. <clears throat> I marched in the synagogue. I went to Hebrew school five days a week. It's amazing God used you a year later. It's almost like an overnight miracle. Mm -hmm. You went from the new birth to ministry in a very short time. Was well, it? Well, there was a lot. There was a lot. You know, <laughs> there's not much I can say because I'll get all shaken up. And uh, my life has been such a miraculous experience. Doc. Forget that anybody's listening, just you and I, okay? When you went straight into ministry. I didn't go straight into the well, ministry. Well, I mean, a year later you were preaching. No, yeah, I was, but the, uh, the events from that experience to the time when I knew that Jesus was alive and he was real and he was the son of God. You know how she started to witness to me? She brought me a candy bar. <laughs> That's right. She said, oh, Morris, I was thinking about you while I was in the store and I thought you'd like this candy bar. You know, I was tough. You didn't know me when I was a youngster. I ran away many times out of the orphanage, picked up by the police, thrown in the back of squad car, brought back to the orphanage. I could tell you stories, make your hair go 
back to its normal color. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm hearing this for the first time, as many of you are, yeah. because we've so never I talked about that. No, I, but you asked me, so no, no, I, I don't tell know, this story but I want to know, very I want often. To know. So I took the candy bar, I smashed it on the ground. I said, you keep your candy bar. Didn't stop her. Next week, another candy bar. Then next week, something else. All she did was pour love mm -hmm. on a little boy that was lost. Mm -hmm. One night, are you ready for this? Yeah, please. Now you asked for it. Please. Okay. One night, I, I couldn't take it anymore. So she had a room in the nurse's quarters. So I snuck out down the fire escape and I went to where the nurse's quarters was and with these hands, I climbed the bricks to her window. And I knocked on her window. I was going up there to tell her, you know what? <laughs> she looks over the rail, over the window, and sees my head up like this. And she throws the window up, takes me by the hand, pulls me into her room. And that was the beginning of me sitting at this woman's feet. And she poured in the love of Jesus. I wasn't saved instantly. It was a series of experiences. And there I had many nights that I had that rendezvous. And she taught me about God. Now, see, I, I knew. I went to Hebrew school. I studied. I knew about an Abraham. I knew about a Moses. I knew about an Elijah. Because we learned that in our Hebrew school. But they were dead to me. I only knew history. But when this woman brought me the love of Jesus. The Bible became alive. Yeah. And I found a living God, not a historical God. Can That's I just, how my life was changed. Can I ask about your family? Your, you had brothers? I did. Were they, where were they at that time? My brother, I didn't know where he was. I didn't know where my three sisters were. All during the time I was in the orphanage, because they never came to the orphanage. Were they saved later too or not? My brother was tremendously born again. I was conducting a crusade in New York City in the boxing arena. And the first night when I gave the altar call, the first person down to the altar was my brother, Abraham. I never knew that either. Yeah. And your sisters? Then he came and worked for me for at least five years. Is he and gone now? He went, he's he's, no, he's he in heaven went, now? He went to heaven. So, so he was yeah. older than you? Older. I was the baby. Okay. And how about the sisters? What happened to the sisters? I can't tell you. Okay. They're married. They're somewhere. Okay. Now let's go from your new birth. So mm. you, you, you got saved. You met the Lord. He became real in your life. Yeah. And then ministry began shortly thereafter. Well, not until I had a tremendous experience. T please tell me about that. No, you don't want to know. Oh, I do. give me something about really? it. Because no ministry begins without an encounter with God like I'm sure you've had. So tell me something about it. Well, that... Uh, I... Uh, 
after, after uh, I had really become changed mm. in, in my whole life, mm. uh, I would read the New Testament under my covers. Little boy, 13 years of age. She gave me a little New Testament this size mm. and a pocket flashlight. And night after night, I would sit under my covers secretly reading this New Testament. I couldn't get enough of the word. I read for hours, hours. Then, of course, the people at the orphanage found out what happened. They found Christian literature that I had in my locker, and um, my persecution began. So I was very severely persecuted. And uh, one day, uh, while some of this was going on, I got up and walked to the front door of the orphanage and walked out. And I never had been back. How old were you? Fourteen. When you walked out? Fourteen. I walked out into a world that I didn't know. But one soul, and that was Mrs. Carroll. Oh, I mean, these these miracle stories you you're not going to believe, so even though you were a man of miracles. Tell me, tell me what happened after. Well, I had a friend that I went to public school with. Mm. His name was Utsdike, a big trucking firm. Now I went when I walked out of the orphanage that night. I went uh, to his home, knocked on the door. I told him what I did. And he said, come on in. Would you believe it? He was born again. His family were all Christians. And so I walked out that night and into a Christian family. Hmm. They helped me get in touch with Mrs. Kerr. And that's a, another miracle. But anyhow, two of us met that night. And... Then I went to live with her brother. They were all born again, spirit-filled Baptists. They all got the baptism of the Holy Spirit under my own ministry. So. But before they they got the baptism, they were just Baptist people who took Bap them Just Baptist, okay. wonderful Baptist. So, so what happened after that? So you lived with the sister. I lived with her brother. Her brother, I'm sorry. Yeah. So Mrs. Ed Brother. Moyer, yeah. M-A-U-R-E-R, -E Moyer. And so, and then what happened? Just take us from there. Well, that was, you can imagine, an explosive night. So, began to go to church. Uh, I never, naturally, never been in a church before. Mm. And I went into an Assembly of God church in Patterson, New Jersey. And um, one was on a Sunday evening. They had a call for people to just consecrate their life. I went down. I didn't know anything about this. I went down, knelt at the altar, mm. and started to pray. And then all of a sudden, I was taken out of my spirit, out of my body. And I was brought to a place, I can't tell you where it was, one heaven, two heaven, three heaven. Theologically, I couldn't tell you. But I was caught up into the sky, 14 years of age, a little boy. And there were a multitude of people as far as your eye could see, all sitting in the sky. 
I was in the first row. All of a sudden, in front of that mass of humanity that you could not number, appeared an incredible bright light. What it was was the manifestation of the presence of God. Something akin to what, like, Moses must have saw in the burning bush. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, when that light stood there, from the right side of the light, a ray shot out. And it encompassed my entire body. I found myself being drawn by that light. And I stood as close to that light as I stand to you. And all of a sudden, the light moved away from me. And I started to emotionally, I didn't know I was crying, didn't know if I was weeping, but I was like broken hearted. This light drew me and then it moved away from me. And I looked where the light was standing. And there were two footprints in the sky. And when I looked into those footprints, I cannot describe this. You only have to use your faith mm. to believe. I saw something that was akin to the fires of hell. And it was there that I felt God asking me, Mars, will you give me your life? And I did. I put my footprints into those footprints. Benny, they matched my feet exactly. And then all of a sudden, that ray that had moved away from me, now it was like it, it put its arm around me. And I heard a voice saying, Arise, shine. For I have given you the light. It's precious. Can I get I'm a box sorry. of Kleenex here, guys? I'm sorry. No, no, please don't be sorry. And and bring us some some tea, will you, for Dr. Solo and myself? I, I I'm so amazed by what I'm hearing, because I've never heard you talk about it ever. We've never discussed no, it. Very sacred. Very. And then... And from there, I knew God had asked me to go to the world. That huge crowd of people that I saw, every tongue, every tribe, every color, every race. And I knew then. And I used to come out of that experience. I never would tell anybody, but I would say, someday I'm going to stand before thousands of people in one meeting. And the church people would mock me. You know, <laughs> little silly boy. But it was true. I had seen it. When you were little, a lot of uh, 
people that got I'm it. Sorry. No, no, please. And bring us the tea, will you? Just let them come in and put it right here. Uh, don't worry about us being live. This is just. This. <coughs> Um, a lot of, of, of the people that God has used, including myself, uh, had challenges as, as we were kids. Yours, you were an orphan. You had no family, really. Your mom gone, your dad. You didn't hey. know what. Can, can I ask about your dad? Did he ever? I found him. I looked him up, found him in Passaic remarried five more children, and I led him to Jesus. Oh, that's precious. Wow. What year was that? Oh, gosh, I don't know, years. After you began preaching. Oh, my. It must have been 10 years later. What did your father say to you? Oh. Uh, when you led him to the Lord? Oh, he was happy, of course, to experience Jesus and stop drinking and, yeah. That's so priceless what you're yeah. telling us. So you, you began preaching at a young age. Yeah. You, you from that vision. Yeah. You, you... Preached my first meeting with Jack Wurtson the Youth for Christ uh, person. He was very famous. Mm. He was famous as Billy Graham. Yeah. God had, has, had used you mightily in those early days yeah. when there was really a revival going on in the world when it came to healing ministries. And, but take us, take us from that beginning when, when, when you began preaching. What where, where was your first meeting? You know, my first meeting wasn't my first overseas meeting. I was conducting meetings in the United States. Yeah, let, but let's stay with the U.S. With my family. Yeah, but yeah. let's let's in the in the U.S. In the U.S. When did you? When was would you say your first service where you preached to a crowd in the United States? I want to tell you first how I got married. Oh, let's go there. I go there. Yeah. Okay. So then, but but now you <coughs> got a lot of beautiful women now. But, but you you began preaching before you were married. Or, yes. Okay. Before. So let's just before. talk about that a minute. So you began preaching before you were married. Right. When was that first meeting? Well, I can't really. I don't really remember the first meeting. I can remember the first experiences. Okay, I'll take you there. Give me one. I well, there was a a a, a Russian, uh, very high up leader in the Assemblies of God, mm. was the chancellor of the Bible School, and the Bible School for the Assemblies was in Suffern, New Jersey, mm. at that particular time. I would go and visit him. I didn't know anybody, and I didn't know anything. And he, like, embraced me. He was Russian. I was Jewish. And we sort of hit it off. He was an old man, really old, gray-haired, and uh, but seasoned. And he would just pour the word into me. Well, I went to the officials and wanted to go to Bible school. The suffering, they turned me down. They said, you're too young. They said, you, you don't have any diplomas. You never graduated high school. I, you can't come into the school. So. This is for you. That's your team. Oh, gosh. Yeah. You're too kind. Well, you know, I mean, we're just sitting here talking, and, and <laughs> I'm going to get mine, too. Okay. Just think about us sitting in, in your home yeah. drinking tea. Okay. So uh, they turned me down. About six months goes by, and the Bible school goes bankrupt. Now, this is the Assemblies of God, mm. historical record. And what do you think happens? 
You, don't fall off the chair. Are you ready? I'm, I, of course. They move the Bible school to the church that I attend. Oh, my goodness. Hey. And? And so, naturally, Nicola was the man's name and the Bible school prison, and he moves there, and he says, now you can come into the school. <laughs> so I went to Bible school for one year. What year, uh, what, uh, how old were you? Oh, I was about 15. Okay, so now let's, let's talk about meeting Teresa. When did you meet your wife? So he moves Bible school from Suffern to Patterson, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Patterson, New Jersey to a beautiful place. They buy an estate in upper New York. And uh, he invites me to come to the school because I've been ha having, uh, you know, a little, uh, giving my testimony here, my testimony there. So he says, please, he said, Mars, come to the school. Give your testimony. So I go to the school, I minister, and we're having lunch. All the students, about 50 of them, and Nikolov, he's sitting here, I'm sitting here, and alongside of me, I don't know when, do I have a picture of Mama? No, I don't. I'll find one, Will if you? it's in there. You keep oh, talking. Oh, yeah. To me. Okay. Well, I can't keep talking if you're reading. Oh, <laughs> I want to show you this. I just happened to open this. This is him as a boy. Would you get, get a close shot of that? That's Morris Sorella as a boy. Yeah. You are quite a cute boy, by the way. <laughs> wow. And, and so, okay, this is, here's one with Teresa. Uh, you look like you were older than 15 there, but I'd like to know when you met her, this one here. Oh, that's just before we got married. That's because um, we're now celebrating our 67th wedding anniversary. Wow. Now, okay, let, hey, hey, hey. Let's, let's look at it here. So you this can't one, clap like this. You got to clap like this. So this is, this is the picture up here with Dr. Sorello and Teresa. And this is young Dr. Sorello right here. I don't want to right here, and this is you and Teresa at your uh, cutting your wedding cake over here. This has got a shot of that. Ah, that's precious. Okay, so I want to know, let's just go back to, to when you met her. Uh, so Nicola is sitting here, I'm sitting here at his right hand, and this young lady is sitting alongside of me. Now I'm watching her, she's kind of fussy here and not eating her dinner, her lunch. Mm. And I looked at her and I looked at her. And after lunch was over, I pointed my finger in her face. I said, young lady, I said, I want to talk to you. Come. Wow. So she follows me. <laughs> and we go out into the vestibule. And I said to you, I just want to tell you something. One day, I'm coming back to this school, and I will marry you. <laughs> How old were you when you said that? 16. 16 years old. Wow. How old was she? Oh, she was, well, she's, uh, she's got her birthday in January. I have mine in October, so she's that much older than I am. By a few months? Yeah, a few months. What did she say to you when you said that? Oh. Uh, you probably won't tell us, right? Yeah, I'll tell you. Okay, tell us. You know what she did? She what? turned around and screamed and ran up the stairs. She and people came from here and here and grabbed me. They thought that I had hit her. She, she got scared. She, of course. <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> when I was 16-year-old, here's a man says, I'm going to marry you. Wham, she took off. Wow. That's amazing. 
So, <laughs> I'm not gonna you think... I'm going to tell you any more about that. No, no, I... Well, maybe you'll get in trouble if you do. Yeah, probably. Yeah, but, but I do, I do want to just ask some questions. But I... Before I do, uh, I'm looking at a beautiful picture of your family. Yes. I suppose that's, that's David. David. Yeah. And that's David. That's Susan. And that's Mark. Mark, yeah. Yes. I, I, I'd like you to, to, to look at this, guys. This beautiful picture here, right on the bottom, is this beautiful family. And maybe today, sometimes, uh, you'll tell us about Mark. Mm -hmm. I will. Mark is in heaven now. Yeah. And uh, that's, a, that's something that's very... Uh, moving. I see you here with Eisenhower. Yes. I've been with scores of presidents, different nations. Well, how the Lord has used you to shake the nations, and, and well, we're going to offer... See, I think that's Indonesia there. Is it what... Costa Rica, yeah. Oh, Costa Rica. Yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that later, about where you've been and oh, who you've met with, because you've met with where everybody. Me you've met them all. But let's see how much we, we, we can get to today. So, let's go from... Now, you got married later, of course, but when, when did you marry Teresa? The next year, I enrolled. But remember, the president, Nikolov, is my friend. Mm. So I'm getting in without filling in applications you know, or anything like that. So I'm back in, I'm in the school now as a student, okay? You are still in your teens? Yeah. Okay. We're not married. I got married when I was 20. Well, let's, let's go from where you left okay. off with us, okay? So you're in school. You're not ready for this. Oh, I am. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. He's not ready for this. <laughs> Try me out. Go ahead. Okay. I enroll in the school. I'm checking in to my room. Mm. And there's naturally two, three people to a room. And who do you think the person that they put me in the room with? Teresa's fiance. <laughs> She's already engaged to be married. Oh, my Lord. And I got a room with her boyfriend. <laughs> now we know why she ran screaming. <laughs> so what happened? Oh, uh, you're talking about a supernatural. I never thought we'd be talking about that today, but I'm loving it. <laughs> so you're, you're with her fiancé. Yeah. She was still young at that time. Oh, yes. She's just a few months older than I. So what happened? Well, I had to work a tremendous strategy, of course, right? <laughs> to, to, right that's right. To, to break him up. That, that guy must be Italian. No, he's, he, they're from Argentina. They're bold people. Oh, are you from Argentina? Both, all three of them. Where, what part of Argentina? Chaco. Chaco. Chaco, in the north. Oh, in the north. Because yeah. I've been all over Argentina. Almost every state in Argentina. Let's forget Argentina. Go back to that room now. <laughs> I, I'm dying to know, how did you break up the relationship oh, with them? And I just had to find a strategy to get into the personal experiences of her life. And anyhow, I managed... After, finally, okay, finally he's after gone. After the he's year out. was over, okay. they were broken up. And then what happened? Did you, did, did she... I'll tell you how I did it. Please. The strategy. Her, the, the school, Suffern, New York, was only ab about 100 miles away from Newburgh, New York, where she lived. Mm. And so her parents would come up to the school. Mm. Her father was an old Italian from the old school. Yeah. And Mama, too. Mm. They're both old from Italy. I worked on them. <laughs> I knew if I could get Mama and Papa to love me. It's a deal. Yeah, then, so, 
I didn't yeah, worry yeah. about Teresa. I, and the mama loved me. She lived with me until she died. The mother, wow. Mother, grandma, yeah. Isn't that precious? Yeah. And you got married? Oh, yeah. You know what they would say to her? What are you going with this other boy for? Morris is such a nice boy. <laughs> Why don't you like Morris? <laughs> so the mama would work for me. So, she didn't know it, though. <laughs> you got the key now. If you win the mom, you win the girl. It's yeah. just that simple. So, so right, uh, mamas? Yeah, of course. 